our current uh, uh, president is un unable to uh, uh, to attend tonight, so I'm taking over for her. And uh, my job is to just open the meeting, introduce the speaker, and then toward the end, close the meeting and alert you to um, the next uh, speaker uh, coming up in July. And then we will have a break in August. We do not meet. Uh, and I will come back to that. And uh, so let me just say that um, this general meeting of CAPCA is one that's very enriching and rewarding for many members, as we have heard over time, for obvious reasons. We are presenting and we are bringing to you speakers who are covering a broad range of topics that are of interest to us as mariners and, of course, as members of CAPCA. And we have guests with us, so it is of interest uh, to our guests too, and uh, uh, I would like to welcome guests who are not Kafka members, or I might be thinking of becoming Kafka members. And um, the range of topics cover uh, anything of interest to mariners, and could be navigation, it could be it could be weather, it could be legal matters, or uh, as uh, or coast guard specific matters, or we we have heard from the uh, uh, from the um, uh, Chesapeake Bay um, uh, pilots. And tonight we, we are covering a topic of interest of, to all of us again, and that is how to preserve our maritime heritage locally. And our speaker is gonna be Tom Gay. He is right there. He is busy making notes. He is, now he is waving. And Tom is the director of the um, of the um, program director of the Seven River Association, so neighborhood waters, and he will have lots to say to us about an area with which many of us are familiar. What struck me as I looked at his, um, at his bio is how busy and active he has been to promote the association, life on the water and the benefit to, to all of us that the water has and how to make use of the water through various means. He is particularly interested in uh, introducing youth to the water. And that is the water above, the navigational aspect, and the water below, crabs and, and, uh, and, and the crabbing feature. And he will talk to us about that. He has been a, a board member he has com been communications director, program director, interim executive director, but most importantly, advocates um, uh, the mission of the association to protect the Severn River so that everybody can enjoy fishing, swimming, crabbing, and recreational activities in and on the river. And that, Tom, struck me as an extremely worthwhile effort. I'm sure you're putting a lot into this. And um, I, for one, appreciate that a lot. And you will, I'm sure, be getting a lot of uh, uh, questions along the way. Uh, Priscilla, who will be waving in a minute, a, a, a valued member, Priscilla will be um, monitoring the chat box. So if you have questions, and before you forget your question, put it in the chat box. And if we do have time toward the end, and if, if Tom is so kind to entertain questions while we are still um, uh, con uh, conducting our meeting, we may have time for, for live questions. But in short, that is how we want to proceed. And so at this point, Tom, I thought it seems to me like you are ready to go. I'm ready to give it a go. Yeah, thank you, Hans. A great introduction. I appreciate that. Hi, y'all. Um, Hello. Good to see y'all hiding in there. Um, I, uh, I guess I, the the big thing is to uh, welcome you virtually to our great Severn River. I think the Severn River is the most important river in all of Maryland. I'm a homer. I've got to be that way. You know, um, we are a 14 mile river. If you're not familiar, and we we're the home of the capital. Uh, of this great state of Maryland. And do you all remember when uh, Maryland was founded? 
Um, that's a very important issue. 1634 is the answer. The reason I know all that is one of my part-time jobs is I'm a dress-up tour, colonial tour guide, and I'm entertaining. Oh, what them. fun! <laughs> I entertain the fourth and fifth graders and trying to remind them of uh, Maryland history. Um, so I'll try to give an introduction, overview of the Severn River Association, and I'll probably keep chatting and yakking until I can get this thing together. So let me see. Uh, it worked earlier, didn't it? It did work, I'm try, yes. I'm trying to, um, there. There you are. Do you have my exciting picture there? There. Okay, Grant. So this is the Severn River, folks. Uh, we have a nice drone shot. This is from the mouth of the river uh, at a little spot called Lake Ogleton, where the Bay Ridge community is just behind at the bottom of the picture. And looking in the distance, 14 miles upriver is the headwaters, which turns, this river turns into the Severn Run environmental stream. It's a freshwater stream that uh, originates up near uh, Fort Meade, a little place called Lake Marion. And it's about seven miles long or so, and then it pours, dumps into the river. So what we're trying to do, uh, we've set a new goal here at the Seven River. Just so you know, we are the oldest river protection group in all of America. We were founded in 1911. This is back in the day before we had sewer systems, before we had suburban sprawl that is now, you know, now Maryland. Back in those days, the Severn River was primarily agricultural. And there were these enterprising development people starting to build little summer cottages on the banks of the Severn River. And they were trying to lure uh, the Baltimore residents to come down and uh, little cottages to enjoy fishing and swimming and a break from the city. Um, we are we have been continuous operating from 2000, uh, 1911, and um, I've been on the board, like you said, I've done a lot of things trying to promote the river. For a while, I was running the whole program by myself. Recently, we've been able to um, do a little fundraising, and now we have some real staff on board. We have a new executive director, Jesse Iliff, will be um, is running the show now. I'm still the program manager. My job is to run water quality monitoring programs, um, which is primarily what you hear about. But I also have a youth program. We call it the Floating Classroom. Uh, the Severn River is also heavily invested in oyster restoration. So I, I'll, I'll be wanting to chat about that a little bit. And going into the future, we're going to be investing more and more energy into stream restoration and stormwater mitigation work. So we've hired a a fellow to be our restoration manager and his job will be go you know over here and work with communities can you see my little cursor the cur and the storm water is our is the number one problem where's the storm water come from it comes from the land it comes from us it comes from impervious surfaces and over time over the last hundred years or so some of our streams have become badly degraded and our number one source of pollution problems in the Severn River, just like in the Chesapeake Bay itself, is stormwater runoff. So that's the guy we're battling. And I've been talking and delaying because I'm trying to figure out how to get this PADF to move. There we go. So we have a new vision. We want to have a thriving river. This is the little sales pitch, folks. And then um, just to let you know, we have a vision, mission, like a lot of groups. We're trying to be community. We have all kinds of communities on this river, all these neighborhoods. I live in one of them. I'm in one of the, what, what we call a water privilege community, Winchester on the Severn, great spot. Um, oh, come on, come on work. Oh, there we go. So there's Jesse Iliff on the left. We've got Ben, the restoration manager, Tom Gay, that's me. And then we have Sarah Winchester operations. Sarah and I coordinate a lot, to, we have, a lot of volunteers are cycling through our programs to help us out to collect water quality monitoring data. And we'll, we have programs that connect. Anyway, water quality monitoring is a big deal for us. We have a floating classroom, which is basically for middle school students. And we're reaching out to underserved kids in Annapolis and in Baltimore. We have a program called Marylanders Grow Oysters in which we go out to 400 local people who have access to a pier and they help us grow oysters. It's an educational uh, program for them. We bring all their oysters every June to a certain spot on the river. And we are able to um, really actually restore oyster reefs. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. 
Um, Ben's going to be working on that second button, restore. He's going to be doing uplands. These are streams. These are stormwater projects on lands, parking lots, houses, community, wherever stormwater is beginning. Uh, and we have a major oyster restoration work uh, a program going in addition to Maryland to screw oysters. I'll show you a picture of that. And then the other part, protect, is the, you know, the sort of, um, this is where Jesse Iliff's experience comes in really handy because there are time, times we have to uh, advocate for the river through legislation, regulation, other kind of development programs. We need a lot of some legal help. Jesse is an environmental attorney, so his skills come in handy um, for that project. So I want to start off by talking about our water quality monitoring program. You can see on the map on the right, all those little dots, that little chicken pox. Those are our monitoring stations within the Severn River watershed. You can see at the bottom left-hand corner of the mouth of the river, three dots. That is Lake Ogleton. That's where the Bay Ridge community is. And then coming up, you see five dots in a creek. That's Back Creek. That's the City Creek. That's also where our headquarters are. Across the mouth, you'll see uh, Sandy Point State Park on there, and you see all those dots. Those are the uh, creeks of the Whitehall Bay area. And then coming up river north of the Navy Academy, you start to see a lot of dots. And those are where we collect water quality monitoring. We do it every week from April, <clears throat> excuse me, April through the end of October. And we are a certified monitor from the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative. Um, they're our scientific background. We follow their protocols. We share all of our data with them and they share it with the regulatory, scientific, academic communities. So when we work with our volunteers, and you get to picture here some of our volunteers, um, we put together crews and we have a couple of roles. We have the lady on the, on the left there, she's our dipper. We are using what is known as YSI equipment. YSI is just Yellow Springs, Ohio. That's the company that makes the stuff. Um, at the end of that cable, that's a 10 meter cable, we have probes and those probes measure. And this is what the lady in the middle is recording. We are tracking the temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH levels, uh, salinity, and the people on the right there are collecting clarity data. And we use a Secchi disk to collect clarity. We do this a lot of uh, out there every day. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a really big picture of the health of our river. We don't have any data before 2018. There isn't really, DNR has one station that was the best we had for years. Uh, but now we have added 52 and we are out there every week. What we've been able to do by doing this is we've been able to determine that there's a huge dead zone area in the Severn River. And you can see here in this area outlined in red, this is where we have persistent evidence of dead zone activity. This dead zone is water with less than two milligrams per liter of oxygen. When oxygen levels fall that low, that's what causes fish kills in our river and in the bay. Fish get caught in low oxygen water and they suffocate. This picture here comes from 2020, 2021. The dead zone area was particularly uh, persistent that year. We uh, calculated that this square mile area is over five, close to six square miles. That's larger than the town of Denton, Maryland. Um, and that was a particularly bad year. Um, but this is the first time anybody's been able to actually track it because we're in these creeks every week. It would be even better if we could do it every day, but we're not there yet. It's quite a mission to be able to do this on a weekly basis right now. And sorry for the fuzzy graphic, but dead zones that the Chesapeake Bay suffers from as well, but dead zones are covered, are created by stormwater runoff and the pollution is nitrogen and phosphorus. Those are the two elements that give us most of the trouble. And the problem with nitrogen in particular is that in the water column, in the water, we are supposed to have algae. Algae are a natural um, organism that belongs in the river. They're part of the food chain. Oysters, um, barnacles, clams, fish, they like to eat algae. But when you get too much of a good thing, you get what is known as an algae bloom. And you can see that over here on the right side of that sort of fuzzy eutrophication chart. Sorry about that, it looked great on a small screen. But anyway, what happens is, especially in the spring, 
when the warm when the water starts to warm up in the springtime and you get lots of light just like all of the, your trees in your backyard and all your bushes start to explode with greenery right they start leafing out well that's what algae depend on. They want to have warm water, lots of sunlight, so they can start growing and they go through the um, photosynthesis process. But the problem is nitrogen is like junk food for algae. And so when you also have nitrogen introduced to the system as well as phosphorus, all of a sudden you have too much of a good thing and you get an overgrowth of algae. And you've all seen pictures down in Florida recently of Florida with the red tide. In our system, we don't have red tide. We have something called a mahogany tide. It literally turns our river red. And in spring of 2020, the entire Severn River turned red, or really a kind of an orangey brown, orangey red. And it lasted for six to eight weeks in May into June. And the problem with algae is that when you get a lot of algae like that, algae goes through their life cycle. And as algae goes through the life cycle, they die. And you can see they're sort of sinking to the bottom of the ocean, uh, bottom of the ocean, bottom of the river. And then bacteria decompose the algae. And it's that decomposition process that depletes the oxygen from the water column and creates the dead zone. And you can see it, it starts to accumulate on the bottom of the river and it tends to go to the deepest areas. Um, oops. So one of the problems is you see um, underwater grasses. Are you familiar with underwater grasses? You've heard of submerged aquatic vegetation. Has everybody heard of that? I don't hear any chatter. Can you hear me? I've heard of it. Oh, OK, OK, thank you. <laughs> underwater grasses are absolutely critical to the health of the Chesapeake Bay and to the Severn River. In the Severn River, the maximum grass we've had in recent generations is about 420 some odd acres, 450 acres. The problem is when you have an algae bloom, the algae blocks the sunlight from reaching the underwater grass. And then the underwater grasses die off and you get into a negative cycle. Underwater grasses are critical because they help clarify and clear the water. They also put oxygen into the water. Underwater grasses also provide food and shelter for crabs, fish, and migratory birds, ducks, and geese. They're also providing food for muskrat and river otters. And we've got pictures of those creatures enjoying a snack, eating the, the seeds from the underwater grasses. So underwater grasses are considered a keystone species. And that's why we find them so valuable. The uh, underwater grasses also can protect shorelines from erosion from wave energy created by wind and storms, but also from powerboat wakes. So there are many, many benefits to underwater grasses. Now, a lot of you all in small boats in shallow areas may think of underwater grasses kind of annoying because they get caught up in your prop and some of the fishermen can't fish in the underwater grass areas. And we are trying to educate the world to be cognizant of the fact that, yeah, they can be annoying, but please put up with the, um, these little minor headaches uh, because underwater grasses are absolutely critical to the restoration of our river and to the bay itself. So we put together all this effort to come up with this chart. This was our big step forward that we're able to advise people that we do have dead zones all the time. Some years are worse than others. Currently, the dead zone is very, very tiny and has not reached this kind of proportion yet. So this is absolutely great news for this year. And it has to do with the current drought. But I'll get to that in a second. So that's the Water Quality Monitoring Program. To reach out to youth, we created the Floating Classroom. And this is a uh, water quality monitoring program. We're using the same gear that our regular monitors use. You can see um, it's in the bucket there. That's our cable. And uh, anyway, what I'm, this is me in the red hat. And I'm with a Girl, Girl Scout troop. This is just a couple of weeks ago. And I'm explaining to them what I just explained to you about dead zones and algae blooms and the importance of underwater grasses. And what we do is we take youngsters out and we put them on the, through the paces. We take them out, we do the water quality monitoring over top one of our oyster restoration reefs, which then gives us an opportunity to talk about the value of oxygen levels and, uh, and how much oxygen oysters need to survive, how much oxygen 
rockfish need to survive and crabs. Oh, it's all intertwined, how everything is all connected. And then after we go through that, and the magic number we keep telling our students is there's a dead zone level, less than two is a dead zone. And a lot of times after we do that lesson at the major in the middle of the river, where usually water quality is good, we then bring them inside a creek. And this is creek here is Loose Creek, which if you can see my pointer, this little circle here, that's Loose Creek on the Severn River. So normally where I'm circling with my pointer is the Traces Hollow Marylanders Grow Oyster Reef, where our growers plant their oysters every year. We have pretty good water quality there. We've seen these oysters grow from one inch to four and five inches, so we know they're doing well. Then we take the floating classroom inside here, Loose Creek, and lo and behold, the kids are often able to say, wait a minute, there's a dead zone here because they've got the meter in their hand and they now know that anything less than two is a dead zone. So um, after we go through the water problem, that opens up an opportunity to talk about storm water. Storm waters are number one problem. So we all talk about well, what can you do to reduce storm water and where the problems start from. And so we go into burning fossil fuels, releases nitrogen oxide that comes from cars, trucks, power plants, burning uh, coal. Those are major sources of the pollution. Some of that pollution lands directly in the river, but a lot of it lands on the highways, bridges, roofs, parking lots, and it stays and collects there until a rainstorm. Those are all impervious surfaces. And what happens then when the rain comes, it washes all that nitrogen oxide off into the rivers, and that's what fuels the algae blooms. So the kids come out there and they, they learn all this and they have a grand time. And then we bring them out. Here's some of the other kids having a good time out here. Um, you can see up in the upper right hand, upper right hand corner, um, the girl in the pink is holding the handheld unit. And that is the YSI uh, handheld monitor. And the girl next to her writing is she's our team captain. And the team captain's job is to record all the data. And we have a whole data sheet and a whole scientific process. And so the students learn the value of recording data. And we do this all out loud. It's the same process we use for our regular water quality monitoring tours. And the whole point is you read, you write it down, everybody says everything out loud. So what happens is everybody starts to realize what numbers mean and they can see conditions, see you in quotation marks. They can see what's going on in the river just by hearing the numbers as we go through the process. You can see the student in the middle there with a great smile and those great shoes. She's the dipper for the day. She's controlling the probe that goes down to the bottom of the river. And she is over top of our oyster reef at Traces Hollow. And it's only about three meters deep, sometimes four meters, but usually about three meters. And we teach them when they're able to lower the depth that you can feel hard bottom and you can also feel when you're touching on the oysters. You can tell just by the difference, the way that weight of the little probe reacts. And then um, the, this young man here on the right, we were uh, completing our oyster, uh, our, our water quality project. We bring up the anchor and the anchor brought up one of the oysters. So we got that, they all got to handle the oyster from uh, the reef. The lady on the left, she's another, her name was Summer and she was having a great time. And I just thought that was a great smile. She is the, uh, she was uh, um, doing the, the, the team leader role, which is writing down the data. And we tell all the students, as well as our monitors, the most important person on the boat is the team leader because that person is writing down the data and the data is most important on the river. So if we have a problem and the boat sinks, it's our job to get the team leader to shore so we can save the data. And they all get a giggle out of that one. So that's the floating classroom. We've been doing that for three years now. Um, last year, we worked with the city of Annapolis Recreation Department. We work with communities up and down the river. So we're working, we're reaching out to everybody. This year we're working with the um, Boys and Girls Clubs of Annapolis and with the Annapolis Police Department. They both have summer programs for students. And we'll be, we usually do this on Tuesdays, getting out on the river. And in fact, one of your members, I think her name was Lori, was the boat captain behind Summer there. That's Lori hiding in the background. She came out and helped us out. All right, one of our restoration and education programs is called Marylanders Grow Oysters or MGO. This is the MGO we have been planting on Traces Hollow from 2010. 
um, four, over 400 oyster uh, growers are helping us out there. And the idea here is to encourage family and community participation. participation. <laughs> so you can see they're growing their oysters, they collect them every June and they dump them on the reef. And the reef is marked with these uh, buoys that you see on the right hand side. That's one program. And we think we've re planted maybe a million oysters there since 2010, something about a million baby oysters. And we've sent scuba divers down to check on them. They're doing well. They're five, four and five and six inches long, long now. Um, another thing that we do once we have the oysters in the ground in the water is we have some enhanced oyster monitoring programs. Last year, we got a grant to do sonar surveys of the oyster bottoms in the Severn River. And we went to all the historic Yates bars. In 1911, the state of Maryland hired a fellow named Yates and he surveyed all the oyster bars in 1911 in Maryland Chesapeake waters. He included the Severn River and we have all those charts. So we know where those oyster bars were. In 1911, we had 25 commercially viable oyster bars. By the 1970s and 80s, they were all gone. We were, they were all gone due to overfishing and then the status of the river got so horrible, everything died off. So we had nothing in the 1980s. Then starting in the 19, I mean, in 2008, we started these MGO program. And then later we started a, a program called Operation Build a Reef in which we raise private money to go out and buy hundreds of millions, usually 25 million oyster spat of shell a year and plant them on these reefs. And we're planting them on a reef called Manresa, Peach Orchard, Weems Upper, and Wade. Those are where we're concentrating our oyster plantings now. These are strictly oyster restoration. They're not for harvesting. Um, and I got a chart that gives you a number on that. One of the ways we check, we, we have a, sonar, a picture array. We try to take pictures of the oysters and see what the environment is like down at the bottom of the river. We use GoPro cameras for that. It's, we're working on it. It's, it's, time has not yet arrived. We also send scuba divers. This is Audrey Pleva. She organized three dives for us in three different years to go down and do a scuba dive. It's called a scientific oyster dive in which we put down a quadrant on the bottom. We scoop up all the oysters. Then we bring them to the surface and we measure how many are alive, how many are dead. We count how many alive or dead. Then we measure the, uh, the size of the live oysters. So far, all of our dives have been able to show that those five oyster areas have more than 50 live oysters per square meter. That's the minimum number of live oysters needed to declare a reef restored in a single year. So we're doing really well. Instead of 50, we've got 86 to almost 200 live oysters in some of our samples. So the scuba diving um, is really helpful. It's, it's, it's encouraging us to keep going forward. Um, Last year, we partnered with the Black Girls Dive out of Baltimore, and they came down to help us. And they are also learning how to scuba dive. And they found the interest, the, uh, the Severn River challenging because the, the Severn River is really murky. And you, know, you can barely see your hand in front of your face. These girls were used to diving in the Bahamas. So they come here, and it was a, quite a difference. But they were able to help us out quite a bit. They were ground truthing some sonar survey work we had done. We went to some uh, oyster bars upriver areas where oysters used to grow where there aren't any oysters now. And we had to confirm that there are hard sandy bottom. And that's the first step in a multi-step process to open new oyster reefs up. First, you have to prove that there's sandy bottom. Then we have to lay down some hard substrate shell or concrete or rock. And then we are also collecting water quality monitoring data at these places to show that there's enough oxygen and enough salinity to um, sustain an oyster reef. And here's a picture that the Black Girls Dive Group took of our oysters on one of our reefs. And you can see that the oyster reef is beginning to reach up into the water column. And because you can see them means that they're, they are beginning to add some clarity right at the bottom of the river. Uh, their clarity impact is not strong enough yet because there's not enough oysters to affect the whole river. But you can see that the oysters are growing. They're getting bigger. They're attracting other organisms. We've got video of barnacles, for example, eating. You can see the barnacle um, mouths going in and out. It's rather cool. And this is another way of trying to show that our investment in restoring the oysters to the Severn River is starting to work. 
Water quality has improved greatly from the 1970s and 80s. Now we have oysters coming up. We have some evidence of natural reproduction in the oysters. And we think the summer of 2023 is gonna be a great one for oyster reproduction. Another outreach strategy uh, program we have is what we call the shoreline census. And this is a program where we teach communities how to use a seine net and to go into their community beaches and do some seine netting, bring the, uh, the small catch ashore and then teach all the kids and the family to, sh to show them how many fish are right offshore on their beach. They don't normally see that. So they're able to see all the minnows that fishermen lo uh, love to go after. There's mummy chugs and banded killifish. There's some Atlantic silver stripes. Sometimes you'll find a, a silver, what do you call them, a pumpkin seed. And so these are educational efforts to get the communities involved in the river, to get their hands wet and appreciate more that it's, there's more to the river than just you know swimming and fishing. There's a lot of activity out there. Um, in the future, the restore effort here is going to be fixing these streams. This is what is known as a seriously degraded stream. Whenever you see a stream that looks like the Grand Canyon, that's caused by massive stormwater runoff from highways and it flushes everything out. And instead, these areas are supposed to be flat tidal floodplain areas. Instead, you're getting these incised waterways. We're gonna be investing a lot more energy in correcting these kinds of problems going forward. Um, another way that we're helping our communities, we're, we've invested uh, teaching communities how to build living shorelines. This is a living shoreline in the West Severna Park area, which is up at the top of um, past Round Bay. Uh, and you can see here, the basic idea of a living shoreline is instead of putting all those rocks right on the beach and ruining your beach, you put them out 30 feet from the shore. That breaks the wave energy. And then you plant grasses in, and this is the community planting the, uh, um, these are shoreline grasses different from the underwater grasses. And they're planting the grasses now. They hold the sand in place, and then they're able to create habitat. Fish and crabs will come into this habitat once it's restored. This is a before picture of, they just had that bulkhead. And this is after, this is all nine months later or so. You can see the grasses have established themselves. They're adding the land, the sand is building up against that bulkhead. So instead of replacing the bulkhead, they put it in front. Now they have crab and fish habitat here at high tide. So this is, this is kind of the future of shoreline protection. And the reason why we wanna protect shorelines is we have crab, in addition to fishing crabs and oysters that we all, we also have turtles and we also have horseshoe crabs and turtles and horseshoe crabs need open shorelines like the one here and the beach behind them. They need those areas for nesting. So it's important to leave some open shoreline in our river. If, you, if all you have is bulkhead and revetment, then you lose your, um, your turtles and your crab population. All right, the Operation Build a Reef. This is a big program. It's a big brother to the Marylanders Grow Oyster Program. We got involved in 2018. We raised some $30,000 and we bought outright 45 million oyster spat on shell. And we put them on this boat. This is the Robert Lee. It's the oyster depository boat. And they have a giant mound of oysters. They flush them off. You can sort of see behind the sign, there's a water, big water hose, kind of like a fire hose. And they flush the, the oysters off the side of the boat and into the oyster reef. So in 25, we did 45 million one year and, and then 17 million. So anyway, we came up, uh, we think it's about 130 more, 134 million oyster spat on shell that we planted. And we think we are getting, um, restoration levels because we send divers down to check how many oysters are still alive. Um, and so far we're exceeding the restoration numbers. But 134 million oysters, even at three years old, are not enough oysters to have an impact yet on filtering and cleaning our river. We think we need 1.3 billion mature oysters in the Severn River. And if we can get to 1.3 billion, we could have a major impact in clarifying and cleaning this river where the oysters could do the work that they used to do back in the John Smith era. They could clean and filter this river in a week. That's the goal. It's a bit of an aspirational goal, but we, you can see we're building a track record and that's where we're going. Um, and again, we're planting them on 
the all five of these areas we planted around the traces all these are getting um, attention from the um, build a reef program and okay the other part about protect this is our this is our leader this is our executive director jesse Iliff. and this is the kind of thing that also needs to be done when the when the state legislature meets in january for three months Jesse's got to be working with the legislators to be advocating for all kinds of programs to help protect the river. It could address, you know, avenues to put more money into oyster restoration, um, or it could be to enforce uh, stormwater runoff rules or permitting rules because we don't want to see clear cuts of all the trees on our river. The, uh, whatever it is, critical area regulation, uh, regulation. There's also sometimes we have to play policeman. We see people who are doing things without a permit. It's our job to report that to the county. They can send a stormwater inspector, put a stop worker out, and make sure that before they restart their project, they put in place the stormwater protection control method so they can keep the stormwater on land and not let it just flush into our river. And ultimately, we're going to have a beautiful, beautiful river, right? So this is some highlights of what we're up to and where we're going. And what can you do? all these things <laughs> spread the word talk about the most important thing you all really can do is to try to look in your backyard and find areas where storm water is rushing into the street and if you can somehow divert that water either using a rain barrel or creating a little rain guard in your yard and have that water stay in your yard and percolate through the grass because if water percolates through the grounds and then goes into the groundwater, that percolation process takes the nitrogen out of the, the picture and then clear, cleans the water. So by the time it does hit the Severn River, the Chesapeake Bay, it's, it's, it's been cleaned up and it doesn't have the, uh, the nitrogen problem, which leads to algae blooms, which then leads to um, dead zones. So that is my presentation. Are there any questions? Did I cover anything that you would like to know more about? We have one question on the chat. There may be others <clears throat> for people to turn on their mics and ch chime in. But sure. the question is, is there a public website where water quality information is available from the water quality program? Oh, thank you. Excellent question. And yes, thank there you, is. Thank you, Terry and uh, Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> All of our data is, uh, is made available through something called the Chesapeake Data Explorer. And if you just Google that, you'll find it. It is run by the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative funded by EPA. We are a certified monitor and we do an upload, but it's, a, it's an annual upload right now. So our data from 2018, 19, 20, 21, and 22 is up, but we're only collecting the 23 data right now. And so the 23 data is not available just yet, um, but I can. We do. We we run some social media stories from time to time, as I give periodic daily updates. You know, they're little snapshots. We go out Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday morning to track this data, and it's because of that and my experience on the river, I guess. But we started noting last August that the salinity level in the Severn River has greatly increased from normal times. And this is important because we're so heavily invested in oysters. We're trying to get a giant pile of oysters in our Severn River. And when the magic conditions come along, the oysters will turn the lights down. They'll turn the music up. They may light a candle, right? And the moon's coming up and they'll get frisky. And they could have a major reproduction event called the spawn. And oysters can do that when the water is more than 72 degrees, which no problem there, we got that. But the critical factor is that the oysters have to have, I mean, the salinity levels that are better than 10 parts per thousand. Normally in the Severn River, we are in a six to eight range, which is why on normal years, there's not a lot of reproduction in the Severn River. But when conditions are right, and it started last year in late August, when we started recording levels of 10 to 12 to 15 parts per thousand in the Severn mm -hmm. River, all of a sudden we got excited because we realized this is going to be the year. So last year ended with high levels of salinity. We got out there in April, first week of April. And normally salinity should be four to five to six levels. It was already at eight. 
And now in the last two weeks, salinity levels have exceeded 10 parts per thousand right on top of the oysters. And we know this because we're there every week recording the oxygen, the temperature, the pH, the temperature, uh, and the salinity levels. So last week we had 11 and a half or so parts per thousand um, conditions for the oysters. So this should be a big year for oysters. Why are we having suddenly high levels of salinity? We can thank the drought. We didn't know it last year, but there was a drought condition starting and it was more prevalent down in the northern neck of Virginia. They already had drought conditions in the northern neck uh, counties. We didn't notice it so much here in the Severn River because we seemed to get rain and it was all that. And talking with the watermen, they were saying, oh, yes, what we're noticing is the flow of the Potomac and the Rappahannock rivers are both greatly diminished. This was last August. And when Ever that those are freshwater rivers. And when that flow of those rivers is diminished, that allows the impact of the Atlantic Ocean to creep in and go much further up northern waters into the Maryland waters of the Chesapeake Bay. So the impact of the, of, of the Atlantic Ocean is being felt all the way into the Severn River right now. The negative of a drought is, well, farmers don't like it. People on wells don't like it. There's some negative impacts. But if you're an oyster, this is great news. <laughs> so. There's always this yin and yang with the environment. Um, we're also, so anyway, at the end of this year, we're gonna, we plan to do more of these, what we call a scientific oyster dive with scuba divers. We're gonna do this in September. We're gonna be going down to check on how the oysters did last year. We, we have uh, 15, 25 million oysters we planted last year. We're, and so we're gonna be checking on them and at the one year mark and see how they're doing. And we're also gonna be going out and looking for evidence of natural reproduction. Um, we have some anecdotal evidence that it does happen. It just doesn't happen a lot in the Severn River. But this is our year, we think. One of the other pluses, by the way, of a drought condition is that with the drought, there's less rain and therefore there's less stormwater runoff, right? So because of the reduction in stormwater runoff, we've also seen le uh, a reduction in nitrogen. The algae bloom activity, this is anecdotal just from our observations week to week, there is dramatically less algae bloom activity this year. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing some spotty indicators of dead zones in the northern parts of our river, what we, you know, Round Bay, if you guys are familiar with our river, but further up the river, we're finding some spotty examples of dead zones. These are dead zones. This is where the, uh, the, wet, the, the oxygen level is less than two. And it's actually less than one, it's 0 0.05, which is considered anoxic, it's no oxygen. But those conditions are just on the bottom half meter to a meter on the bottom of the river. Last year when we had bigger problems, the dead zone was four and five meters tall. Right now it's just limited to a meter just on the very bottom of the very deepest areas. This is much, this is much better news for our river this year. So another impact, of the Severn uh, of the drought is that we have much higher levels of oxygen. So our oysters are happy, the rockfish are happy. And the only problem is all this is we're starting to see sea nettles already and it's only June, but they like salty water and they come up and express themselves in salty conditions. So this is probably not gonna be a great swimming year if you're not a fan of sea nettles. Um, the other bit of good news I can report is that the amount of underwater grasses increased slightly from last year over the last year, which is great news. We had three years in a row of declining acreage of underwater grass and that trend reversed to slightly last year, which was great news. Um, so thanks for that question. <laughs> Sorry for the long answer. Anything else? I can't hear you. Just mention for the, uh, for the audience, the link for the Chesapeake Data Explorer is on the chat. You scroll oh, good. You Thank you. That. Thank, Thank you. you, Dave. And when you all go there, you have to drill down into that map, all right? And every time you go back, it doesn't say, but you can drill down into the Severn River, or you can go to Baltimore Harbor. The, uh, the Baltimore Blue Water Group uh, does their reporting on the same program. But you can drill down into the rivers, and you can see these little dots. And when you click on the dot, that's one of our monitoring stations, and it shows you all the data that we're collecting. Um, the other plus, plus, by the way, with the drought is with less stormwater, less fewer storm incidences, uh, we are not having uh, 
swim alerts as often as we've had in the past. We have some swim alerts because of bacteria and the bacteria comes from pet and animal waste. So your pets, your dogs and your pet, cats, their poop ends up into the rear. And then all those great uh, deer, all those herds of deer that are running around in our neighborhoods now and the fox and the possum and all those guys, yeah, they're contributing to the problem. And in the Severn River, we have a lot of septic systems. So in a heavy downpour, septic systems can overflow, um, but it's not as serious a problem as it used to be. And so we're having fewer incidences of, of, of having to close a, a community beach, for example. So there's another plus to a drought. Um, other questions, anything else? Could we love you guys to come visit our river. Do you know that the river is a scenic river? We're officially a scenic river. Yes. Go ahead, Hans. Open, turn on your mic. Oh, I can. Okay. Can, all right. Uh, Tom, yes. I have two questions. All right. The first one is, you, you mentioned community involvement, and toward the end, you mentioned the rain garden, which is a terrific idea. I'm wondering whether you are promoting the rain garden idea to those uh, uh, homeowners who are uh, uh, close to the to the beach and to the uh, to the watershed. We, we do promote that, and we work with our partners, the Watershed Stewards Academy, which is uh, a a major group here in the Severn River area. They also uh, cover the Magathy River. It's basically Anne Arundel County. And they really focus on encouraging homeowners to uh, put in rain barrels or rain gardens. We do the same, particularly in a presentation like this, where I say, what can you do? Well, a rain garden. And then I, we, we would do have materials, you know, for here's what a rain garden looks like. But for those of you who are not familiar, a rain garden is, is um, it's not building a pond. You're building a depression in your lawn where the water can collect during a storm and then within 24 hours, it dries out. So you put plants in the little depression area that are water tolerant. And what's really nice is you can put flowering plants and turn it into a butterfly garden as well. And the whole idea is to capture the water on your property. The, the idea of a rain barrel, the rain garden is the same. When we, when we finally have a rainstorm, all that rain that hits your roof, what's happened between rainstorms is that, remember I mentioned, the culprits here is nitrogen oxide coming from fossil fuel emissions from cars and trucks and power plants. That lands on your roof and it accumulates on your roof and on your sidewalks and everything else, but on your roof in particular. And what happens is that first flush of a storm washes all that nitrogen oxide off in the first flush and it goes into the rain barrel. Then you can capture that water in the rain barrel and then use that water later in the week to water plants, and that's okay. Or you can just let it loose in your yard and which it just slowly percolates through the ground. And it's that percolating passive action that cleans the water and then it goes down into the groundwater and then joins the river again. So that's the idea of a rain barrel and a rain garden. When you all are driving down a highway and you see those sort of depressions along the sides of the roads, those are rain gardens. Those are bigger rain gardens. So they call them bioremediation areas, but it's the same idea. They're taking the water that runs off the highway, putting it into those swales on the side of the road where the grass might be longer. And the idea is for the, for the water to just soak through the ground. The worst thing in the world you can do is what you did in Kansas City. You take a nice stream and you concrete it out. Or you take a gutter that goes along your sidewalk and you put a concrete gutter in instead of having the, um, um, you know, a natural gutter. What happens there is that when it's concreted or it's on the road, the water rushes off in massive high volume and it's hot water. And rivers and the animals in the river don't like hot water coming in them in a big, huge flood and a massive flood. So the idea of rain gardens and remediation gardens and all the other techniques that people are using, the idea is to capture the water, slow it down, let it then settle into a pond or a rain barrel, and then let all that water percolate through the ground. If you're a gardener, man, you know, you save your rain barrel when you have a real drought, you don't want to get another water bill. So you can use the rain barrel to water your plow, your, your vegetables. And it's, that's a great way of doing it. So long answer again, sorry, Hans. <laughs> what was your other question? 
Yeah, my second question, Tom, we had a, a speaker earlier this year, a, 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 a creative, wonderful uh, young woman who, who was and is the river keeper of the Chester River. Oh, okay, and, yeah. And my question is, are you collaborating with ri river keepers uh, that at least are nearby, near, near the Severn River? Well, we'll cooperate as much as we can, but we're all sort of local, right? She's she's protecting the Chester and I'm in the Severn. And you're we, busy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we're all supportive of each other in the bigger, yeah, yeah, go, you know, we cheer each other on. Now, technically, the Severn River Association is not a river keeper. We don't hold that title, but we're doing all that same work. We just don't own the, uh, the franchise to be calling ourselves river keepers. But we're doing the same kind of work. We have, we have ag aggressive water quality monitoring programs and we have advocacy roles. We're patrolling our river. We're, we're doing things. We do have a river keeper on the Severn River uh, and it's called the Severn River Keeper. Uh, they're uh, concentrating on doing all those stream restoration projects. You know, that big picture of that inside stream, that's their specialty and they're doing a lot. They do that kind of work. Um, and so we're picking up the other. So in that way we were co cooperating. We're doing the, we're doing the water-based work. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, you know, thank you, Tom. Sure. Tom, I noticed on uh, the shoreline restoration, there was one. There was one slide there where it looked like there was a bunch of stakes and looked like string crisscrossing the new vegetation. Oh yeah. Are, are you? Is that to keep something out of there while it? It's grows? to try to keep birds for out of there. <laughs> it's to discourage birds from coming in and eating the grass when it's young. Ah, okay. That's why they put them in there. Um, after the grasses have matured and they've really taken hold, then you don't need to keep the birds out so much. But at first, the birds are a challenge to a new newly planted grass. Just like you throw grass seed out in your front yard today, and the next thing you know, the robins are eating that $20 worth of grass. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we're all in competition in a way out there. Yeah, I was just wondering what it, what it was that, that would be getting in there. So that makes sense. It's mostly to keep the birds out, and it's obvious to keep people from tramping over the grass too, but it's mostly the birds. So one day we're also looking at all of our osprey on the Severn River. We got a lot of, well, you guys have seen it all over the place. You know, the osprey are everywhere. We have eagles on the river. We have three types of herons. There's the great blue, we have a night heron, and we have um, a green heron. And I've learned that there are three types of crows. I didn't know that. And what happens is on our water quality program, we are mostly relying on people who are unencumbered with day jobs because we're going out Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday mornings, right? Because that's when it's quiet on the river. You don't want to do water quality monitoring on a busy Saturday with all the power boat wakes. So we concentrate on those unencumbered with day jobs. And then we also bring in some college students. Um, we have created uh, three or four internships for college. Three college kids are working with us um, this summer and a high school uh, student as well. They're learning the basics of water quality monitoring, what it means to run it, how do you coordinate with all the, co uh, all the boat captains who are helping us out, with all the volunteers who join our crews every week. Then they go out, they learn the process of collecting all the data, then we have to take all that data, go back to the office, sit there and upload the data into an Excel spreadsheet. So that's a bit of a manual chore. And then we have to, then we manipulate the data. Once we have enough of it, we can say, hey, here's a chart of the Severn River this year compared to last year at this site. And here's a graph that shows the difference in salinity levels, for example. Um, so we, 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 <laughs> we have fun with the kids and with the grownups. And it's because of hanging out with those people who have the time to help us out Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday eight mornings that I learned about green and herons and yellow herons. Because people come in with all their different backgrounds. They have all these experiences and interest levels. And so you're meeting new friends out on the river. You're getting an after, a morning's worth of uh, outdoor sunshine. You're exploring your river. And we've broken down our river into five sections. So over time, all the volunteers, and they tend to live in our river system, all the volunteers get to explore the entire river. Most people who live on the river and any river know like their local creek or their local community and, and they go to Annapolis or they might go over to St. Michael's and that's all they see. But when they're on the boat with us, we're going inside each creek and you get a whole different experience. And so people talk about all the things they're interested in. 
and you know, I'll tell you the story about why we're related to Tycho Brahe and the 16th uh, century astronomer, if you guys uh, want me to go on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would be interested, but maybe another day. <laughs> another day, it's a longer story. Yeah. We have, we have another question uh, from yeah. Dave Oler. How do the newly grown oysters do with respect to the diseases that were killing oysters? Well, we are fortunate in that we have not had serious outbreaks of disease on our oysters in recent years. And one of the problems back when the disease was a big deal was water quality was also much poorer than it is today. And so with the poor water quality and hot um, water and the environment, we had bigger disease problems a few years ago. But since we've been monitoring our oysters in 2010, we have not picked up any incidents of disease, which is great news for the Severn River. I was at the Oyster Alliance Conference in September. We're a member of the Oyster um, Alliance. And one of the scientists was explaining that the oysters have evolved a tolerance for those diseases. So when the diseases come through, like we're developing a tolerance to COVID, oysters are developing a tolerance to, to, to dermo and, and the other diseases. So they're actually able to survive outbreaks of disease or they're resistant to it. So it's not as serious of a problem in recent years as, as it was a few years ago. Okay. We have Why they one. genetically created that resistance, it's beyond me. I didn't get through genetics in college. It was a tough one. I mean, I made it, but it was hard. <laughs> Uh, another question. Um, you mentioned comparing data as it's collected. What's the impediment to getting current year water quality data on the Chesapeake Data Explorer so that it's more widely available? Um, there's a couple of issues, and we're trying to figure out how to make it more up to date. The Chesapeake Data Explorer was created, my understanding is that it was created as a data sharing platform for research. And as soon as we all, all the river groups like ourselves started uploading, we asked the same question, hey, how can I use that to give a little picture? And it turns out the data explorer was built for a different purpose. It wasn't built for that community outreach, outreach communication piece. So we're trying to solve that problem. It's not readily available. The big hindrance for us right now is really the data uploading process on our end. Once we get our data rolling, and we're just we're getting that underway now, we can then produce um, charts and graphs and make the data available on a spot basis. But we're unable to do it in a major way at the moment. So in lieu of that, I write little stories about what's going on on the river, and I'll say, oh, here, you know, at the bottom of the river, we had great oxygen today, and here's the levels. Oh, we had a dead zone here. Here's what it is. We do updates like that, and we're hindered in the ability to make an instantaneous outreach. If you, whoever asked the question, have an idea on how to make it happen, we'd love for you to come to the office and show us. That would be grand. Okay, Terry, show up. <laughs> <laughs> but we are, we are cognizant of that problem. We're trying to figure out a way to do it. And so is the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative. So. By the way, there's a um, Chris has added an addendum about the disease, et cetera, oyster disease uh, in the ch chat. So if you're interested, uh, go to the chat and scroll through this very interesting answer. And if you all know differently from what I, my answer about the disease, uh, I'd love to hear about it. We just have not seen it in the Severn River and since we've been doing this. Um, fortunately, we've also seen very few incidences of Debro um, it's, it's there, it's a natural disease that hurts people, but we have not seen it as often as people used to see it. That, and, you know, Vibro, these diseases are all natural. They've been around forever. It's just that when water quality really deteriorates, it exacerbates the problem. That's my understanding of what uh, creates these issues from time to time. But I'd love to know better if somebody knows more. Very good. Uh, if there is no other question, then it is my pleasure to thank Tom for a very comprehensive, very comprehensive uh, <laughs> presentation.
Well, thank and, you. And I just saw Chris's comment that the disease flourishes at 14 parts per thousand. So thank you. I did not know that. So we're lucky that we never get that high. Yay. So down in Virginia, they might have that problem going on a lot more than we do because they don't have a problem with oysters not reproducing annually. When we were down there with those guys last year, they don't even think about it. They reproduce all year long and they have 15 parts per thousand salinity all the time. So the Virginia oysters may be having more of a disease issue than we are at the moment. So that's really good news to know. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, that's excellent. So again, Tom, the, the complexity of your work is just astonishing. And uh, you're alerting us to a part of, uh, of your work and life on the Chesapeake Bay that we, that we normally do not think about unless we read in the Washington Post that, uh, uh, that matters happened, had improved or not improved. And here we are greatly enlightened. So thank oh, you very much. Thank you, Hans. I'm, I'm glad you appreciated it. And, and if, if, our, if our system works and normally works very well, you will receive in the mail a little thank you uh, package, very small, and um, oh, yeah, <laughs> to, to, <laughs> to, uh, to recognize your presence and also what you have uh, given to us, which is uh, greatly appreciated. Oh, well, thanks. Appreciate You're it. Glad, glad to be helpful. <laughs> and to the members, I want to alert you that um, look for the website next month's speaker. It will, the speaker will be announced ahead of time. And uh, then in August, we will not meet and resume again in September. So uh, you have time to play and uh, enjoy the, the water enjoy the Chesapeake and we will see you next month for the general meeting. Thank you all for attending. And again, Tom, thank you very much. Thank you all. All the best to you. Nice Take to care. see you all. Come visit us on the Severn. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll be watching for you out there. Uh, okay, all right, Tom. It's Thursdays and Friday. <laughs> thank you, I'm glad you remembered. And by the way, you're, you're welcome to join us and volunteer. Just give me a buzz. We'll put you on the boat. You don't have to come prepared for anything. You learn everything on the boat. We have Excellent. a 20 foot maritime skiff. That's our scientific research vessel. Very good. That raises a right. question. Your, your monitoring stations, Tom, is, is that just a, like a GPS location or is there something there? How do you get yeah. to them? I mean, oh, we get them. I don't need to know, but I'm wondering how you get to them. We get them by boat. We have a 20 foot boat called Sea Girl and everything is by waypoints on our nav systems. So that's that's basically it. Yeah, that's good. I was I was uh, thinking you wouldn't really want a physical structure there because who knows no. what would happen. Yeah. <laughs> now our, our program is middle of the river, middle of the creek program. There are other programs. And the reason for that is that at the deepest part of the river or the creek is usually where the dead zone accumulates. And there are other programs where you do them off of piers, but piers oftentimes miss the dead zone activity because the dead zone is not in the shallow water usually. So that's why the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative is sending us to the middle of the rivers, which has to be done by boat. Yeah. Woe is me, I gotta get into a boat every day. That makes sense, <laughs> yeah. Again, thank you everybody, Priscilla for man managing the Q&A session. Dave for for handling all the technical matters and getting Tom up and running. That was wonderful. Good to see Thanks, you all. all and to see you next month again on Zoom. Until, until then, goodbye. All right.